the series were focused on mascots, logos, imagery, and cultural appropriation, and land back and land justice movements. Genocide and resettlement may appear to many as things of the past, but it must be acknowledged that a history of colonial disappearance of an entire people, their children and their land has a clear and horrifying imprint in today's racist stereotyping that only holds a false supremacist mirror to native youth and to all who are subjected to being forced into an image not of their own making. It is for this reason, among others, that Double Edge determined to add easements to the 100 acres of our farm center to the Okiteo community, in addition to the workshop and studio spaces for the cultural center. Where the voices of Okiteo are determinant and have the final word on their own identity. Please learn more about the previous parts of the series on HowlRound or sign up for the next two in the series, September 19th on art and social change and October 24th on oppression and erasure through public plaques and statuary. I wanna take this opportunity to thank HowlRound for broadcasting and also holding all of the Living Present series on, on their website. Uh, to the National Endowment for the Arts, the New England Foundation for the Arts, and to our sponsors at Jacob's Pillow and the Strategic Partnership at Mass Humanities. I hope you've had a chance to see the exhibit in the pavilion by Andre Strong Bearhart Gaines Jr., the Okiteo artist in resident. Or if you want, if you haven't seen it, you can also see it following this event. And now the co-directors of Okiteo. Rhonda Anderson is a Nupiak Athabascan from Alaska. Her native enrollment village is Kaktobik. Her life work is most importantly as mother, a classically trained herbalist, silversmith, and activist. She works as an educator activist on the removal of mascots, water protector, indigenous identity, and protecting her traditional homelands in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge from extractive industry. Rhonda curated vi vital, vibrant, visible indigenous identity through portraiture an ongoing collection and exhibit of native peoples of New England and is curator of living presence. Rhonda has been named a Commonwealth heroine and is commissioner of Indian affairs in Western Mass and a founder of both Okiteo and the Native Youth Empowerment Foundation. Larry Spotted Crow Man is a citizen of the Nipmuc Nation. He is a nationally acclaimed award-winning writer, poet, and cultural educator, traditional storyteller, tribal drummer, dancer, and motivational speaker involving youth sobriety, culture, and environmental awareness. Larry's books include Morning Road to Thanksgiving, Drumming and Dreaming, and The Whispering Basket, and are available online or through the Double Edge or Okiteo websites. Larry recently premiered a segment from his new play, Freedom in Season, and the full-length production will be um, presented over the course of the next year. He has been a board member of the Nipmuc Preservation, is on the review committee at the Native American Poets Project, and is the artist in residence at uh, Bunker Hill Community College, and travels throughout the US and Canada and parts of Europe to schools, colleges, powwows, and other organizations sharing music, culture, and history of the Nipmuc people, and lectures also on Native American sovereignty and identity. Larry is co-director of Okiteo and also the Native Youth Empowerment Fund Foundation. And now Larry will welcome you to Living Presence. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy, for that beautiful introduction. Thank you all for being here, Kunipiam. Thank you 
Vous savez que tu es un autre, 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 un I greet you in the Algonquin Nipmuc words that reflect the ground that we are on right now, the trees, the water, and all the land around us that we must reflect and kind of center ourselves and think about those words because they are not just words as we are taught, they are the ecology of the, of the space. And so with that, I also want to share a, a welcoming song. Once again, thank you all for coming to Okiteo. Okiteo is a Nipmuc word for a place to plant and to grow. And so because of all of you, we are growing. Thank you. Yes. Oh my goodness. Um Kaktobik Mia Goranga, Fairbanks Mia Naya Noranga, uh Pamapak no Uranga Korenami. Anupiak Shinaga Alak, Tanak Shinaga Randa Anderson, Shabaktunga Western Massachusetts Commissioner on Indian Affairs, me, Shabaktunga Co Director of Okateo Cultural Center, me, and Native Youth Empowerment Foundation. So, Koyanak Nalag Nagisi, thank you for being here. I just said good afternoon and welcome in my language. Uh, my name is Rhonda Anderson. I'm in the back at the Baskin I'm from Alaska. Um, I grew up here in Western Massachusetts. I lived in Plainfield and went to school, elementary school at the beloved old Sanderson Academy right in the center of town. Um, but I choose to live here in Western Massachusetts. And the land that I'm really privileged um, to steward and live on is in Coleraine. Uh, it's the traditional homelands of Sakoki, Abenaki, and Pakamtuk on the Pakamagan watershed, um, which is known as the Green River today. So I want to recognize this land that we are all guests on. Not all of us, most of us are guests on. <laughs> and this land that we are all benefiting from is Wabanaki Confederacy Territory. Um, Wabanaki means the place where the sun is born every day. And that makes the people of this territory, um, people of the Dawn land. So tribes historically local to this area would be Sakoki Abenaki, Pakamtuk, Nipmuc, Nanatuk, and Mohican tribes. Um, Sakoki means people who go their own way. 
and they're still here as a state recognized tribe in Vermont. Um, Pakumtuk is a Mohican Pakumtuk word uh, that would translate roughly to people of a narrow swift stream or river or a swift clear stream. Um, Pakumtuk were absorbed with their kin, uh, the Mohican Abenaki and Nipmuc. Uh, Nipmuc means people of the fresh water and they are a state recognized tribe in Massachusetts with a small reservation of land that has never been ceded or out of tribal hands. Um, Nanatuck means the oxbow part of the Quinnituckwa River, and local tribes also absorb the Nanatuck. Um, Mohican translates to uh, people of the waters that are never still, and that's referencing the Hudson River. War, genocide, dispossession, and colonization that press the Nanatuck and Pakumtuck to seek refuge with their neighboring kin tribes also pushed the Mohican Stockbridge and Muncie bands west in the late 1700s through 1800s to Wisconsin, where they have a reservation today on Menominee territory. The Mohican tribe does have a office in Williamstown, Massachusetts, and lands in Troy, New York to maintain their local ties. We are in the watershed of the Quinnituckwa River or Connecticut River. Quinnituckwa means long tidal river. And this river has known many names right, by many different groups of people along its flowing path, but Quinnituckwa is kind of stuck. So it's important to remember that while indigenous communities have lived, gathered, farmed, hunted, and fished in this area for thousands of years, they're still here, and not metaphorically, physically still here. So please get to know the indigenous people of your area and ask what you can do to lift and raise their voices, to honor and respect their sovereignty. So in that spirit, in this land acknowledgement, I would like to give three action items. First, recognize and make changes to dominant narratives that glorify colonization and genocide of indigenous people of this area in particular. Be mindful that problematic terms like Pioneer Valley, are a reminder of a legacy of dispossession, removal, and subsequent erasure. Second, please consider supporting any one of the Native tribes and organizations represented here today. Um, we will post a resource list and toolkit after this event. Lastly, there are uh, currently five bills in the State House that five tribes, no, six tribes of Massachusetts support that address removing racist mascots from public schools, changing Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day, that's why we're here today, and a bill respecting cultural heritage, another to create appropriate educational curriculum in our schools on Massachusetts tribes, and one to create a permanent commission to ensure local education uh, to ensure the education of local Native youth in the state. Um, so please contact your legislator through maindigenousagenda.org and encourage them to sponsor and support these bills. So thank you for listening. And again, welcome um, to the Living Presence of Our History Part 4. Um, this is going to be a conversation with Indigenous leaders um, and scholars regarding the importance of Indigenous Peoples Day. And my goal is centering and listening to indigenous voices, as that is the very first step in understanding and moving forward. So this IPD movement has been happening since 1977, right? With the first official IPD happening in South Dakota in 1987. So this is nothing new, but it took 10 years to get the first one to, 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 to happen. So thankfully, locally, we have seen the neighboring towns of Amherst, Northampton, and most recently East Hampton, as well as Great Barrington, Brookline, Cambridge, Newton, and Somerville begin to celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day. Massachusetts is on track to join these 14 states in observing Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, Alabama, Alaska, Hawaii, Idaho, Maine, Michigan, Minnesota, New Mexico, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Oregon, South Dakota, Vermont, Wisconsin, and the District of Columbia. So 26 states do not currently celebrate Columbus Day and more than 130 cities and towns observe Indigenous Peoples Day instead of Columbus Day, with many, many more joining the right side of history each year. So 
you know, I personally applaud every city, every town, every school system, every business, every state that chooses this right side of history on making this small but vital step in creating a resolution that's inclusive of all their residents, of all of us. So I, I also wanna give this standard warning <laughs> that we will be using terms today in language that is difficult to hear. Uncomfortable words that you're likely going to hear are intentional genocide, intentional cultural genocide, dispossession, torture, rape, murder, and white supremacy. But we must acknowledge these challenging words and these truths of colonization and its legacy. We must understand that colonialism is profoundly impacting indigenous people in many ways to this day. We must be able to understand that colonization is not only a historical action, but colonization is an ongoing and continuing practice. So please listen, check where that energy of discomfort begins and feel those emotions by all means and understand where fear or guilt might sneak in, maybe even feeling defensive might come into play, but learn how to sit with those feelings and use that energy for a greater good. Only when we recognize these horrible atrocities can we then move forward in a good way. We must move forward by lifting indigenous voices and bringing balance to this heavy narrative by highlighting our contemporariness, our successes and contributions to mainstream society. So I am honored to, I'll get to this now, I'm honored to introduce the panelists here today. And I am grateful for their <clears throat> presence and voice on this vital topic. As I introduce each panelist, I would like to ask a quick round of questions to get to know each individual and how their lived experiences intersect with this topic today. And unfortunately, I ask that the panelists try to keep the answers to around two minutes or less on this, this round. Um, Jorge Barracuta Estaves Taino hails from the Cibo Mountains of the island of Quisquea, also known as Dominican Republic. He is one of the architects of the Taino reclamation movement, which began in the New York City area some 35 years ago. Uh, Estevez was also employed at the Smithsonian National Museum of American Indian for 25 years. And um, he was a museum program specialist and assistant to research. He organized over 424 programs uh, with native people from Alaska and Greenland all the way down to the tip of South America. This is what this is the kicker. Every Monday between 1 and 5 p.m., you did 961 workshops on Taino culture, language, and history. In addition to this, he is founder and cacique of the Iwaagua Taino people of the Caribbean. This tribal group is pan Caribbean in scope, with membership originating on all major Caribbean islands and the diaspora. Currently, Estaves and his group are in the process of publishing a Taino language dictionary. So Jorge, I need to mention, like, how did you find the energy to accomplish 961 workshops in one afternoon? <laughs> okay, <laughs> I all right, all right. I was waiting for that. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. So really, right? So really, when did you begin to understand the need for education um, on your tribe? Like, what events led you to this life path? Well, um, my own personal journey began when I was five years old. Um, so I've been on this journey my entire life. Um, I would constantly run into individuals from Puerto Rico, particularly, um, and some of the other islands who I did identify as Taino, but we never had, we didn't have anything organized. We began meeting each other at powwows, you know, and uh, grow, slowly but surely, the, the, the need grew to, um, to, to get this thing back going and to, and to acknowledge our ancestors, and also to show the academic world that, uh, that the Tainos did not disappear, that we were still here, very much here. So um, it's not a, a single effort, it's an effort of many people, um, but uh, eventually we won, you know, eventually, um, quick story, when I first joined the, the museum, when I first went to the museum for the first time, I was 11 years old, and there was a sign that said, sadly, by 1565, all the Tainos had disappeared. And I always wanted to kick that sign down, you know? <laughs> and um, when I left, uh, when I retired two years ago, I left behind, not myself, but a group of people, a, an exhibit, um, which was uh, about the Taino survival. 
So now the Smithsonian acknowledges Taino survival. And, uh, and that to me was amazing to see that come full circle like that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. That's beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. Did you get to kick the sign? Uh, <laughs> sort of, but not, not the way I wanted to. <laughs> um, Dr. Darlene Flores, a Ryabo and chiropractic physician, is a mother of three children. Born of Boracua parents, she was raised in the metro area of Massachusetts. Uh, her great grandmother, Irene, was a traditional corandera, midwife, and Santa Aguera. Um, Dr. Flores continues her family's legacy as a holistic huercero, which is a bone setter, and holistic energetic worker to treat patients of all ages. And her uh, treatments combine traditional acolados and teas. Dr. Flores is a traditional medikeeper, medicine keeper for her Taino Iguagua tribe. And she is also a United States veteran who is highly decorated for her participation in the war in Iraq. Dr. Flores owns and operates a wellness business in Brookline, Massachusetts called Caraya Wellness Clinic. Known for her um, activism and advocacy for more holistic medicine to be taught and practiced in the BIPOC community, Dr. Flores prides herself on preserving the ancestral ways to raise her children and serve native and indigenous communities. So Darlene, welcome and thank you for your service to this country. Um, you know, as an herbalist myself, like I'm really happy to know that you're continuing these traditions, right, of healing. Um, so where did you learn your traditional healing from? Um, I think it was innately that uh, I just had certain abilities as a child. And um, it wasn't until I guess coming of age, my grandmother took me aside and said, wait a minute, you know, you're doing this, you're doing that. And there's a lot of things that I did not know were native, but we just automatically would do them. Like the teas and the massages and you know the type of stuff that we ate or how we interact with um, mother nature at the beta. So I really didn't realize that was indigenous until I'm growing up with non-indigenous people. They say, what are you doing? I'm like, what do you mean? What am I doing? You guys don't do this, you know? And so um, things like that is what uh, I continue to do. And um, I am a mom of three children. So I'm very involved with the community and trying to keep my children um, following the ways of our ancestors. And I am a, a member of Higuayagua and I owe a lot to my cacique, which means chief, um, keeping me in line and um, making sure that uh, <laughs> I'm following the ancestral path. Thank you, Mabrika, yeah. for having me. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing. Um, Melissa Ferretti. Um, can you wave, Melissa? Hi. <laughs> Melissa Ferretti was born in Plymouth County, um, daughter of Bernard Marston Harding of Herring Pond, Wampanoag, and raised in Cedarville, South Plymouth by Verna M. Harding, who is um, a Herring Pond, Wampanoag tribal elder. Um, a descendant of Love Saunders. Melissa attended Plymouth Carver School System most of her life and graduated from Pembroke Academy. Melissa is a Commonwealth of Massachusetts licensed real estate associate and a notary public. She is elected chairwoman of Herring Pond Wampanoag Tribe located in Plymouth, Mass. I know Melissa is super busy. She's crazy busy, but she uh, volunteers much of her time to her tribal community, like all of her time, I'm gonna say. In her dedicated role as chairwoman, she currently serves on several committees and um, is engaged in social justice, health and educational initiatives. So welcome back and thank you so much for finding time to be here today, Melissa. <laughs> nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Yay. Um, so my question to you is, um, did you get a sense that the education in the schools that you attended and maybe even the surrounding communities, did they support the history and contemporariness of your community? Oh, well, I, I, I would have to say, you know, without giving my age away too quickly, uh, <laughs> when I was educated in the Plymouth Carver school system, I would definitely say that the, you know, the Mayflower and the Pilgrims and the, you know, the um, romanticized Pilgrim story and Thanksgiving story was certainly more recognized and appreciated than the indigenous um, story. 
I don't really feel growing up that I myself even really knew who, who I was until I, you know, got much older and was able to really get to um, understand the, the actual um, genocide that happened and uh, just, you know, it's just a really, it's really tough when you get to that point, when you realize how oppressed you really were growing up. So yeah, no, I don't, to answer the question, uh, I don't feel as if my time growing up in Plymouth school systems, Plymouth Carver, it was at the time, we were very much appreciated, unfortunately. I, I would imagine, uh, I would imagine that there was a time where I wore, you know, where we were celebrating Thanksgiving and I was to wear paper hats and uh, feathers and all of those, those wonderful things that we at least, you know, are cognizant of now. And I do hope moving forward that um, Plymouth Carver and Plymouth School System and, and others in the Commonwealth do start to really think about uh, getting Indian education into the system. We are in talks with Plymouth Schools currently uh, to try to get these programs. But when, when I was a child, you know, in the 70s and 80s, we were. I don't really feel that we were supported, no. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, that's such a hard thing to, to hear and, you know, but we're making changes, right? <laughs> Moving forward. Um, another panelist I'd like to introduce um, is Claudia Foxtree, Arawak Yoruman, um, is a professional educator can you say hi, Claudia, wave so that we know who, yay! <laughs> Educator and social justice activist um, who teaches courses and workshops on transforming curriculum and culturally responsive uh, teaching practices. Claudia has been a middle school special education teacher for over 30 years. Um, Claudia also earned her bachelor's degree in psychology and anthropology from UMass Boston and a teaching certification from Fitchburg State College and a master's degree in education from Northeastern University with a focus on educational research. She's currently a doctoral student at Lesley University. Um, Claudia has been a board member of Massachusetts Center for Native American Awareness for over 20 years. Um, you are a, Claudia is a tribal member of the Lukayeke uh, Guaina Taino, um, and a Massachusetts liaison for United Confederation of Taino People headquartered in New York. Um, UCTP is dedicated to promoting um, human rights, cultural heritage, and spiritual traditions of the Taino and Caribbean indigenous citizens in their social, economic, educational, cultural, and spiritual development. Welcome, Claudia. Um, my question for you is, I heard you once quote your daughter as saying, our existence is an act of resistance and intervention. Can you please expand on that really powerful quote? Let me begin. Tagwe Dutunu, Kena Atiano, Nirman Arak, Dakadiri, Claude Foxtree, she, her, currently a guest on traditional unceded, unsurrendered Pawtucket territory. Um, you know, we've already heard just a, a touch of what Indigenous people have gone through on their own lands. And when I say own lands, I mean our own lands in terms of um, territorial land that the same groups have inhabited for millennia, and also the lands that we visited, traded, and moved upon, even if they weren't the lands that our people settled on. And everything from that first contact with a lost sailor has been about making indigenous people invisible. From writing out of history books, to erasing languages, to forcing changes in religion, to um, doing a census and saying, well, I guess they've all disappeared because indigenous people aren't showing up in the square to be mass murdered, for example. So everything has been about making us invisible. So when we speak up and when our allies speak up to include voices, to point out inaccurate information, we are resisting the forced invisibility 
Um, and even with what I would call hyper visibility, it works in two ways. One way is a performative way. See, I have invited an indigenous person to be in my a teacher at my school or a presenter at my school. So in a performative way, which is only it, the reason it's done is because there's already an invisibility. So that's kind of funny. Um, and also in the um, hyper visibility way where false images and explanations of history are shown as see we include only it's not an accurate story or image or words or you know fill in the blank and so our visibility is almost in a, a um, pretendish kind of way like a cartoon where our true people speaking for us or us speaking is our act of resistance of being here. And I wanna add one other small piece about resistance. Even if there were a day where there were no indigenous people, everything we have contributed to this country and the world would continue to exist. So even in that way, we are, and our future generations and the thing, the legacy of what we have contributed to the world continues to resist being made invisible. Thank you. That's really powerful explanation of that quote. Thank you very much for sharing. <clears throat> Next, I'd like to introduce Brittany Wally. Brittany is a Nipmuc anti-tribal mascot representative and a member of the Mass Mascot Steering Coalition and a member of the special commission established to redesign the state flag and seal of Massachusetts. Um, she has sat on a lot of panels focused on the removal of native mascots and the observation of Indigenous Peoples Day. When she was young, Miss Wally's father, Big Tree, um, Bradley Big Tree Wally, uh, served as a Nipmuc powwow with her uncle, Henry Sly Fox Wally. This strengthened uh, Brittany's uh, motivation to examine the needs of her community, and it pushes her to seek out where she can apply her strengths to serve it. Um, Miss Wally is also a traditional and contemporary artisan, focusing on the woven goods of native Eastern woodlands uh, cultures. Uh, her work has been featured at Plymouth and Patuxet, and also at Concord and um, Antiquarian Society, where she is currently uh, cataloging uh, local native artifacts to help the museum comply with NAGPRA, which is Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Ms. Wally holds a bachelor's degree in sociology with minors in philosophy and business management from Rhode Island College. And she will be starting critical ethnic and community studies uh, programs at UMass Boston this fall with the goal to become a stronger advocate for indigenous voices. Thank you, Brittany, welcome back. It's so good to see you. Um, oh, so, you know, playing off of, um, what we've just heard about, you know, Melissa made a comment about uh, Plymouth. I'm gonna go there. So uh, did you, like, have you uh, experienced any of that? Like working with, I don't know if I should say that, working with Plymouth and Patuxet, did you like to experience like that sort of romanticized mythological point of view regarding colonization and how that leads to our invisibility of our cultures? So just to start off, good afternoon. Um, to answer that question would take a lot more than two minutes. I would definitely say that there are some things I miss about working there. I've always interfaced with the public. I usually interface with younger folks because um, I used to teach martial arts to little kids too. So uh, being able to educate from, from that standpoint is something that I think is really beneficial. Um, I do think that there are some structural issues that can be addressed when it comes to telling history, this kind of history, um, and with some, with a place as established really as Plymouth Patuxet, um, I think that they should have the experience and the minds and the knowledge to really deeply understand that those changes need to happen and, and they need to be happening uh, yesterday. 
So um, I would say that there are some things, again, that I did enjoy doing there, but um, I think that there are deeper issues that do need to be addressed. Um, the romanticizing of the colonist story uh, can definitely happen. I can't control, no one can control who comes through the museum and everyone's gonna come with a different um, outlook. You know, you could get someone local from Plymouth. You could get someone from across the globe who has no concept at all. You know, you, I, I might've been the first native person that they ever met, it's a little daunting. Um, so you can't really control what people are coming to you with, but you do have control to a certain extent from where I was working from to educate them. And hopefully when they leave, they're at least brought to a place where they can have a transformative moment to get over that romanticizing and to see some truth. Thank you for sharing, Brittany. And last but certainly not least is Heather Lavelle, she, her, hers. She is a um, second generation Italian American and co founder of Italian Americans for Indigenous Peoples Day, a Massachusetts based group supporting Indigenous led efforts uh, to rename Columbus Day and eradicate Columbus statues and place names in the public realm. She is co founder of two successful Indigenous Peoples Day campaigns and is the first. Um, the first in her former city of Melrose, Mass, and more recently in Bedford, Massachusetts, uh, where she currently resides. Both uh, communities are located on the unceded ancestral lands of Massachusetts tribe. Um, Heather also assists the Massachusetts Indigenous Legislative Agenda um, in advancing anti-racist legislation, addressing critical concerns of Indigenous communities. Heather is a museum director and curator in the Boston area and a mother of two. So Heather, thank you so much um, for being here today. Hi everybody, um, thanks for having me. It's so good to see you in this way. I, we're always on panels together. And so, <laughs> um, so what brought you to this movement? Um, what, what, what brought you to this movement um, uh, to recognize Indigenous Peoples Day? Uh, well, first I wanted to say that I'm just really honored to be here and in awe of every single one of you. And you've all educated me so much and um, I'm just very appreciative of all the time and energy that you spend on this. Um, so um, I think I got here today just by um, just my sense that I've always wanted to understand uh, my like in order to understand myself and my place in this world. It's I've it's always been driven to kind of learn about who has come before me, um, not just my own family's history, but the histories of the first people of Atlanta, which I live and that understanding had always kind of been based in the past and I have less of a knowledge of the living presence of indigenous people that we're talking about here today. Um, but that did change when I became a mother and I realized that we had moved to a school district with a racist mascot. And I learned very quickly that it's very difficult to compel school administrators and community members to feel empathy for individuals that um, they don't believe even exist. And so I really began listening to um, and learning from indigenous people, Claudia being one of them in those early days and developing a broader understanding of how profound the erasure had been, particularly in our part of the country and the many ways that the genocide continues today, our celebration of a white supremacist um, being one of them. And so um, I've learned, you know, that, you know, as an ally, it's really important for me to help to create a space to center Indigenous voices and in that they, Indigenous people must lead in any advocacy work that affect it, on issues that affect them. So um, I began to get more actively involved in Indigenous people state efforts after witnessing the horrifyingly racist pushback directed at Indigenous people by my own people um, at public meetings where renaming the holiday was being discussed. And I talked to Matoe Monroe of Indigenous People's Day, Massachusetts. That's the Indigenous-led group that has been organizing IPG campaigns for decades and um, learned from her that it would be really helpful to have a group of progressive Italian Americans that um, could help provide sort of an anti-racist argument counter argument to the to the intense pushback. And so that's um, how Italian Americans for IPD was formed. 
Great, thank you for sharing. So I hope you, the audience, um, that every one of you kind of heard this collective lived experience, right? The experiences and the need um, to create educational opportunities to understand the many cultures of indigenous peoples better and to reasonably assert that we are still here. Um, so I feel like I should really mention today um, that we have two tribes on the panel that experienced uh, two of the most significant first contact events, um, albeit nearly 130 years apart. So I believe it's essential to recognize that indigenous people on Turtle Island today are compromised of over uh, 600 tribes of which roughly 560 some odd 574 are federally recognized. And we have many different cultures and even different races. Um, so I feel it's important to highlight the many points of view um, on what Indigenous Peoples Day means, because that will be different for everyone. Um, so I think it's important to ask like that question directly. Jorge, <laughs> <laughs> you have traveled extensively, right? And you have worked at um, the National Museums of American Indian. Um, so what does Indigenous Peoples Day mean to you? Well, uh, a lot of things, but I remember one day I was at the museum and, uh, and a tourist came in and asked me what the museum meant to me. And, uh, and I told her, you know, that having the objects in a certain space and everything, you know, but then I realized that, that outside of the museum, it's like nobody knows what's happening in Native America. It's almost like, like Native people don't exist at all, you know, it's not in, in the public consciousness uh, whatsoever. So the Indigenous Peoples Day is that same thing, you know, it's like having that, that uh, awareness out there so that people understand that there are issues and that Indians are not something that you just see in movies, you know, that there's a lot of real issues that are going on and the people are still here. Um, at the museum, you would get a lot of these questions that, are, you know, that could relate to this um, from foreigners who were more interested in Native people than the people from this country. And that to me was a was uh, amazing and, and very disturbing, you know? Um, there were people that would come in from Belgium who knew where the museum was and people right up the street who did not know that the museum was there. And here was a museum with over 1.5 million objects, you know, from all over the Americas. I mean, there's so much history there and it was basically unknown. So a day like this puts a lot of um, focus on native people, you know, and to tell the truth about what actually happened here, you know, so that's it. Yeah, thank you for your point of view. I think that's very important. Um, Melissa, what are your thoughts on Indigenous Peoples Day and its importance as your tribe was one of the two that uh, was, was directly impacted by these significant contact events? Well, okay. So, um, I mean, I guess as an herring pond Indian, as we were called, you know, back in the day, um, you know, we were a once powerful nation, right? Uh, nearly 90% of our people were um, lost after the disease and the people at Patuxet, I mean, we were literally under the boots of the colonizers. Our ancestors were forced out of the colony to flee down to the furthest reaches and the borders between Plymouth and Borndale. I think for me, uh, in some way, it would be a great form of healing, right? Um, we're often, as Claudia had said, invisible, we're misunderstood. Our histories and our narratives are, are unfairly or not written at all. Uh, you know, the narratives and the blatant forms of cultural erasure are just really right in our face. So I guess for me, um, you know, all of these things, they, as I, once again, I, I echo that it makes us feel invisible. You know, it perpetuates false information about the Herring Pond tribe, the Patuxet people, that it was a total loss. And, you know, this is written in history book after history book inaccurately. And I just feel that if we were to be able to embrace Indigenous Peoples Day, then it would give us some form of, you know, healing for our community. Um, you know, we idolize these, these murderers and, 
you know, not just Christopher Columbus. I mean, growing up in Plymouth, we have a mile standard state forest named after a murderer, a man who kept the head of Widow Wayment on a pole in the colony for however many years, along with King Philip's head that sat in this colony, literally under in the heart of our traditional homeland. So I don't think it's much to ask to recognize and uh, uh, acknowledge the first people of this land and throughout the country and abroad. So I guess for me, it would be a great, great amount of healing. And I, I would hope my community would agree with me on that. Yeah, thank you for, um, thank you for sharing. And I think, what was that 20 or 25 years? Um, King Philip's head was on a pole in the center of town. So it's a little excessive. <laughs> um, Larry, what does um, Indigenous People's Day mean to you? Like, what, is, um, what does it look like to you and why is that important to healing in this country? Well, yeah, that's a very profound question on uh, many levels. Um, you know, just to think about, you know, I come from three generations of children who were removed from their home. The last one was my grandfather's oldest brother in 1907 was taken. And um, the hell that me and my siblings went through going to school here in Massachusetts, as we discussed in the previous panel, and uh, the way we were treated. And then thinking about now in my 50s that there's actually an Indigenous Peoples Day, it's, uh, it's quite profound uh, to think about the abuse, not from other people, but from the teachers that now we have this day and, um, and people have different thoughts on it, uh, but what I look at it as is an opportunity to open up space, space for this education to take place of the things I'm sharing in a more significant way about the brutality, the racism, the removal, and things that happen that are not abstract, they're shared and lived experiences for myself, uh, my little cousin over there, uh, Br uh, Brittany, and, and all of our community people that are, are from here. Uh, these are not things that, you know, you have to read in the book, I can tell you. You know, I knew my grandfather and he knew his grandmother. And so these are things that are passed down, not only physically, but traumatically through our genetic makeup that bring about all this different pain. And so I, I applaud this opportunity to have a day that allows people to engage in that, that pain. And as uh, Rhonda pointed out earlier, it's gonna be a hard conversation. There's no easy way out of this. And uh, people should really understand that. You know, you're talking about over 500 years of suffering. And so that has to be accounted somewhere in some place. You know, we've been taking that, doing that heavy lifting. And now we have our allies uh, coming on board, uh, supporting this and, and kind of engaging in that because we know we all need this to heal. And so I see it as a wonderful opportunity as an educator myself to bring forth um, um, this information wherever people find themselves living on somebody's ancestral homeland that you can learn and engage with that community right there and see how you can actually help. Uh, these intentional uh, uh, actions that can make change, real change. And I think we're moving in that direction with this Indigenous Peoples Day. So, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you for sharing, Larry. That's really important um, to understand the healing aspect. Um, you know, I thought really hard, long and hard about the topics and the flow of this panel. I'm on the phone with Jorge, like, ah, how do I, how do, I do that? You know, and I, um, I really want to have a conversation. I want you to get to know our humanity and our shared experiences. I do understand that we must tackle the issue of Christopher Columbus. However, I do not feel like we need to center him here. I even had him on our flow at one point. And I was like, you know what? No, I, 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 I realized that we really, we really don't have to. We don't have to include him here. Um, but I also realized that we cannot talk about Christopher Columbus and colonization um, without first understanding who the Taino are, um, because this is where the centering should be when we talk about Columbus. Um, so Jorge, uh, you have mentioned before that you constantly educate others who deny and invalidate your identity and insist that Taino is an extinct culture. Right. So who are the Taino and how are they thriving culturally today? Okay. Um, thank you, 
Thank you for that. Um, all right, so that's a very broad question uh, and a very important one. So you can break it up like this. Um, who were the Taino when, when the Europeans first landed? Um, the Taino people are um, derived from various tribal nations, all of the Arawak um, uh, language uh, who migrated from um, Venezuela and Guyana across uh, seven to 8,000 years. Um, so that by the time that the Europeans landed in 1492, when we discovered Columbus on our beaches, we had already merged into a single, into a single unit. Um, diverse um, regionally, but our languages were very similar and our, our material culture was, was the same. Um, what a lot of people don't know is uh, that the history in the Caribbean, when it's told by the Europeans, uh, it's, it's done in a paragraph, you know? So um, Columbus landed, sorry for using the name, but Columbus landed, um, the people that were there were enslaved because they were very peaceful, et cetera, et cetera, all myths. And within 50 years, they were all gone. And that's it, the story is, is gone. What the people don't know is that it took over a hundred years for the Spaniards to actually uh, um, conquer the region. There was a lot of uh, small bands of people fighting across the island. For example, the very first treaty that was signed in the Western hemisphere between a native nation and an Indian nation uh, with, with, with the Europeans was in the, in the Caribbean, you know? Um, so uh, when you read a, a lot of the, the Caribbean history, you will always find mentions of Indians living here and Indians living there. But we're always, uh, um, you know, I, I like to use the term paper genocide, right? Because, uh, for example, there was a, there's a town in the Dominican Republic called Boya that was listed as an Indian uh, town until 1793. And basically, the way we lost our jurisdiction in that town was that when the census takers came, they realized that a lot of the people no longer spoke their language, and therefore, they were no longer Indians. That was just their idea. So they listed us as extinct, and that, that village lost its, uh, its jurisdiction. And this happened all across the Caribbean. In Puerto Rico, you have an instance where, um, in, again, in the 1790s, must have been something concerted, but in the 1790s, in one year, they list 4,000 Indians living in a certain lo in lo location. The next year, they call them 4,000 people of color, no longer Indians. So you see, with a pen, they can. They, I think the pen did more damage to us than, than even uh, um, the weapons, you know. Um, and uh, and that's what we've had to contend with throughout our history. Um, as I was growing up, my my entire life, I always, you know, I remember when I first came to the United States. I was living in a predominantly white neighborhood. And uh, in school, the teachers would ask me if I was Indian. And when I mentioned yes, and they asked me from where, and I would say the Dominican Republic, uh, then the story changed. Like, oh, you can't be. And actually, one teacher actually brought me a, an encyclopedia to show me that there were no Indians in the Caribbean. <laughs> you know, after she herself asked me if I was. So this was always on my mind. You know, it was always, yet at home, I'm hearing all these stories about. Theo Choro was a, a shapeshifter and he could do this and he could do that and listening to all these stories, how we plant, how we grow things. So that's what drove me to try to understand what, where did this myth come from and how, and how did it develop? And that's what I did for most of my life. And sadly, but uh, amazingly, it was uh, DNA, you know, which is something that it's like a double-edged sword, as you know, but it was DNA analysis and sequency that finally brought us back into the limelight because when they started doing DNA uh, sequencing uh, in the Caribbean, they weren't even looking for Indians because it's taken for granted there are no Indians in the Caribbean. Um, and then they found that just in Puerto Rico alone that over 61% of the people were of in fact indigenous ancestry. And you would think that, uh, that there it is now, now that we would accept it. But uh, the historians couldn't believe that their narrative uh, was wrong all this time. So they countered with, well, these are Indians, but they're not Indians from here because Indians were brought as, from, as slaves from, from the mainland. <clears throat> and it wasn't until three years ago that they started doing ancient DNA testing and they found uh, four skulls in the Bahamas, one of them, one of which they had a tooth with a full strand of ancient DNA, which was over a thousand years old. And that was like that moment for us because now that we're gonna compare the modern day people with that one strand. And uh, they chose 170 Puerto Ricans 
and 170 Puerto Ricans came out connected to that soul too. So, so the Tainos were, were back, you know, but for us, the people that always identified as Taino, it, it, it's, it's like a slap in the face because it's like, we were here, we were telling you this all along. I have always focused on our culture because I think that's more important than genetics. You know, um, uh, there are what, I, what we call eight markers of indigeneity, everything from spirituality uh, um, to, um, to planting ways. And if you look at these markers all across the Caribbean, you'll find that they're everywhere, you know? But um, for a lot of ethnographers, when they come to the Caribbean to, to do these works, if you start out with extinction, they don't go in that direction. They don't follow, you know, these traditions. They just claim, you know, assert uh, or rather imagine that they're African or Spanish and no, no mention is made of them, but, uh, but they're there. And uh, now we have an opportunity to, to show the truth, you know, to tell the truth. So that's what I do. That's what I do for a living. Hey. <laughs> Oh, that's so beautiful. Thank you. How many languages are uh, dialects are there in Taino language? Uh, well, Arawakan dialects. The Arawak language is the most uh, is the most widespread language family of all the Americas, actually, because mm -hmm. it's spoken all the way from southern Brazil all the way to Central America. Um, but uh, within the Taino ourselves, um, you know, we have we had sort of lost our language in in a sense. We lost a lot of we, a lot of words survived. So uh, different individual Taino organizations have um, begun working on languages themselves, you know. Uh, it's a problem for some, for, for me, it's a good thing because I figure like 35 years ago, we had no languages, now we have five or six. So it's a lot better, right? So, but we are even our language is back, you know, and we are actually in the process of, of um, publishing our, our own uh, language dictionary, which will be out pretty soon. So. That's great, congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. I know it's a lot of work. <clears throat> So I would also like to uh, center that indigenous people um, have long been struggling to overcome colonization, right? So my question is for you, Claudia. Um, I've heard you speaking at the Genocide Awareness March um, in Boston, Marchez in Boston several times. Um, can you please expand for us um, the lasting effects of ongoing colonization, genocide, historical traumas, and our current outcomes as indigenous people today? Uh, not in five minutes, and I can still get us started. Um, colonization, especially in the US, um, as described by some researchers like Bray Boy, is uh, European thought, knowledge, and power structures that dominate present society. Um, and how that thought and knowledge system underlies indigenous people's loss of land and sovereignty. So colonization is directly related to what happens to indigenous people. And colonization is an ongoing process that is endemic to the United States policies. It's a drive toward material acquisition. And for material, that can be controlling land, people, resources. Traditional schools, and that's really my expertise, the educational K-12 system, although I speak at a lot of places, teach the values of the colonizers, the beliefs, the knowledge systems, everything that supports the colonization, narrative of these are the ways to be, to take, take, take. If you read Robin Wald Kimmerer's fantastic book, Braiding Sweetgrass, she has a, um, it's a longer title, that's a short version of it. She has an entire chapter on the Wendigo, the Wendigo who just keeps taking and never gets in a relationship and never has reciprocity and, and doesn't care what gets destroyed in the process. And that is colonization. Decolonization is making the indigenous stories visible. So going from that invisible to the visibility. That means that we recenter indigenous knowledge, we recenter indigenous role models and histories, um, and we do it not just in our 
curriculum, but also in our teaching practices. So instead of sitting in rows in a classroom, we're sitting in a circle. Instead of always raising our hand, we have a process that everybody gets to speak. Um, though, so changing the practices from the colonizer way of looking to the indigenous way of looking. And as it turns out, many marginalized and vulnerable populations, including the black population and students with special needs benefit from some of these decolonizing strategies as well. Um, and some of decolonization is also direct re directly related to um, dismantling things that have been culturally appropriated. So a lot of things within the indigenous community like um, images and language, um, place names and names in particular have been appropriated by the dominant culture and, and cultural appropriation is about a relationship where the dominant culture takes something from the marginalized group and then often repackages it and sells it back to their own group. And then that becomes the way that you see the thing instead of the original way that the indigenous people had or the original word um, and it morphs into something else. So that is in school systems and educational programs, um, something that we need to always be aware of. And other things in our school systems that have to do with um, colonizers and and genocide and not respecting indigenous people who are here and caring for the land is, for example, the requirement to say the Pledge of Allegiance every morning in a school system. The Pledge of Allegiance was written in 1892. And if that sort of starts to ring a bell, it's because it's the 400 year anniversary of 1492. And it was written as a um, way to celebrate Columbus. Um, so that act in itself is keeping colonizer perspectives alive um, and re-traumatizing probably not just indigenous children but other folks too. Um, it wasn't until 1942 that under God, no, 1954, that under God was added. So, you know, those kinds of practices also are part of the, the traumas. Uh, for me personally, I remember um, knowing I was Arawak growing up and not knowing a single other person who identified as Arawak or even Taino at that time, um, except my own relatives. And I remember um, asking my father, who is the indigenous of my parents. How do you spell that? How do you spell that? For years and years, because I never saw it in print until 1992, when um, there was an awareness to get indigenous information out in, at the um, 500 year anniversary of that event. Um, and that affected my identity. That was about 35 years ago, so similar to other panelists. And in that time period, I would meet people who identified as Arawak and as Taino and as other Carib, other groups from the islands. And it was like putting together a puzzle. Everyone had a piece. So if it was about, um, you know, what, what was this, clay, what did this clay pot mean? Someone knew where to get the pottery. Someone knew the song that you sang when you gathered the clay and the song that you sang when you built the pottery. Someone else knew the story that went with the image. Someone else knew the name. And from those pieces, um, part of decolonizing and part of uh, reaffirming our own identity is putting those pieces back together in the way that we need to do in this contemporary society. So it might be a written dictionary where we didn't have written language in that way forever. We had other kinds of ways to communicate. So we have the right to adapt to our environment around us and to prepare, uh, be a good ancestor to the next seven generations as well. So thanks for letting me speak. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for um, thank you for your point of view. I think it's very important to understand um, <clears throat> the different forms of colonization um, to indigenous people on this continent. And it's you know it's also important to realize that you know our outcomes today you know um, are still affected, um, and that's a direct result of our our struggles with colonization. Um, 
I want to go back to the land acknowledgement um, because that's the first step in recognizing and celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day. It's understanding um, that anywhere you are on Turtle Island, you're on Indigenous land, right? And understanding that dispossession, war, genocide, right? That all gave you the result that allows you to benefit. So the first step um, should be part of your planning and IEPD event is um, whether you're in a school or a town is finding out whose land you're on. Um, you know, there, there must be that kind of equity in planning and inviting a local indigenous people to the planning table is crucial, right? And even, you know, like they, they're, there needs to be a seat at the table for them to be able to um, have a say in how in Indigenous Peoples Day is going to be celebrated. And even I, right, I'm an Ubaq, uh, from Alaska, you know, like even I need to recognize like when is my time to sit down and uh, give space for the appropriate Indigenous people of the area to be centered and lifted, right? So I might be Indigenous, but not always the right kind and in a good way, <laughs> right? So um, that's kind of a big question that we encounter often is how to appropriately celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day. And um, you know, what are some of the appropriate ways to commemorate this much needed holiday? Brittany, I'm gonna go to you. Um, can you add more, like add some examples of appropriate ways to celebrate, you know, maybe lifting and centering indigenous people, celebrating our successes? Sure, so yes. And I really do enjoy that question. Um, it touches back to a conversation that I know I had with someone who's Taino, um, Rina. I don't know if she's in the audience or around Rina Aduro. And um, we were talking about this, this list. We wish there was a list of do's and don'ts that we could distribute all across the land to different areas, different communities of what you could do to respectfully and properly observe Indigenous Peoples Day. And I know I actually chatted about that with you too, Rhonda. Um, and I think it sparked a really good conversation. So Starting off with, yes, of course, acknowledging the land that you're on is a huge, huge part of it. It's it's so huge and basic to me in the sense of sometimes I'm functioning in this bubble where that's a given, right? But I have to take a few steps back and realize not everyone is there yet. So when someone asks, what do we do? Even though you've already said it, I would say again, really look into the land that you're on. But in that same breath, I would then say, what are you gonna do about it? There's a good, um, there's a good kind of humorous video on YouTube. I think it really talks about a, a television being the land, right? For the land acknowledgement. If you, if you walk into someone else's home and you take their TV and you bring it to your house and you bring your uh, friends over, have a movie night and you start your movie night out with the acknowledgement that the television used to belong to so-and-so, and now we're going to watch our movie and enjoy ourselves, you're not doing anything about the fact that you know you stole that TV. <laughs> so what are you going to do about it? And that goes back to creating relationships, right? Reciprocity. And that can come in many different forms that I, I could never address in, in five minutes. But I think personally, the next step is to reach out and connect with your local tribe, of course. Really hear what they have to say. And I think from there, you'll be able to walk forward together in a good way. If you, if you are an ally, if you're a non-Native person, or if you're a guest in the lands that you are on. Um, so that's really, I know it sounds so basic, but that I really think is going to be the key. Um, another thing that I would consider too, is that a lot of the... Um, things we're dealing with when we talk about how colonization is still active, it's still a present phenomena. Um, it's not necessarily Native people's fault, right? Um, I always think about one thing. Uh, one way that land was taken from us was if colonists decided that we weren't using it. <laughs> You're not using your land to the standard that a colonist thought you should be using it. It's not yours anymore. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I struggle with that um, a lot because I think that everyone doesn't use every square inch of everything no matter what 
way you're looking at it with what culture. Um, but anyhow, <laughs> acknowledging the land that you're on, making a connection about it, but then even if you can't reach out to those native people, right? Because it's not our fault that things are the way that they are, still try to follow something that is truly respectful. And that's what brings me back to that first point of having a list of do's and don'ts, because just like native mascots, I can imagine Indigenous Peoples Day going um, sideways in a sense of, oh, we're doing this to honor you. And then all of a sudden people are back in, you know, paper feathers all over again. So I would say, um, really thinking deeply about how can a non-native or how can how can someone still help fix a problem because it's not always native people's um you know burden to shoulder it's not a problem that we created uh so it's not going to be our responsibility to fix the entire thing having a seat at that table i think personally is is fundamental but how can communities do it without having to make native people feel like they're spread thin um I think that links back to having a relationship, even though, you know, um, you may not be able to bring, like, let's say, five different towns invited me, not that they have, um, to their Indigenous Peoples Day event, I certainly wouldn't be able to make it all. But if they had a connection with my tribe, they might be able to then go, oh, okay, we should, we should avoid doing, like, the paper feathers situation and we should look into doing something more constructive so I can't say that I have all the answers but those are the connections and kind of the um the stream of thoughts that comes up when that question is brought up but back to the fundamentals learn whose land you're on and what are you going to do about it excellent points thank you very much Brittany um Darlene you have been working with Newton, right, to bring yes. the first Indigenous Peoples Day celebration to life. So what are some appropriate ways to celebrate that you've been working on? So I am in Newton, Massachusetts, and we are in the process of having a ceremonial celebration on Indigenous Peoples Day, which it is officially changed from CC to Indigenous Peoples Day, um, which is usually the second Monday in October. So this year it falls on the 11th of October, which is a Monday. And um, we have invited um, uh, my chief, my cacique, to come and do a cultural presentation on Taino, because a lot of people don't even know what or who Tainos are. Like I said, um, we are the people that found Christopher Columbus when he was lost at sea in 1492 when he sailed the ocean blue. But um, I was uh, born and raised here in Massachusetts. So when I learned about CC, I thought he landed on a Plymouth Rock. Mm -hmm. You know, I had no idea, you know, that they were talking about my people. And um, when I did get older and I, and, I, and I knew the true history and I said, why are they teaching this in the schools? You know, um, I'm the oldest of 10 children and having these conversations with my younger brothers, they said, you know, how many of our friends would have graduated from high school if they just included us in the history books? And that to me was profound, you know? And oh, how many of us would actually admit that we have indigenous roots? Um, and that to me was an eye opener. So my children, I have uh, age nine, seven and five, they know their history. And two years ago in kindergarten, when the teacher said to, my son, all right, everybody, remind your parents, Monday is Christopher Columbus Day, do not come to school. My son turned white and he said, that guy is a bad man. He <laughs> killed my grandparents and chops off the hands and arms of little kids, boys and girls. So everyone in the classroom started to cry. And they said, we don't want Christopher Columbus coming to our house on Monday. <laughs> so this is a kindergartner. And that's when the teachers were like, wait a minute, you know, we need to know who are the children in our classroom. And then, you know, then they brought me some of his paintings and they said, we thought we was, he was having a little bit of a delay in, in speaking, but he was saying, you know, this word and that word. I said, those are Taino words. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about doing a candy dance at a powwow. I said, yep, we do that too, you know, and they had never even, these are educators that don't know who Tainos are. So to me, that was an eye opener. That was, to me, it was like, 
this has got to change. You know, I lived through this. I'm not going to allow my children to live through this. So it's so important when Matsuin came to me and said, we have a chance to fight it again and try to change CC to Indigenous Peoples Day. You being a Taino descendant, it's super important that you come and speak your story, share your story. And, um, you know, so that was, I was like, no, this, is, this has got to stop, you know, and it starts with education in your own home. You know, um, like I said, you guys even speak some Taino words, you don't even know it. Um, hurricane is a Taino word. Canoe is a Taino word. Um, and there's a ton, a lot of other Taino words that you guys speak that you didn't even know. Some of our foods you eat, sweet potato. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that uh, you guys don't even know that are Taino. And it's like, we're invisible or paper genocide. And so I am here to say enough is enough. Um, every two years, we've been bringing up to the state to try to get this changed. So speak to your local uh, councilmen, uh, speak to your representatives and support changing uh, CC to Indigenous Peoples Day come January so we can continue making Massachusetts uh, anti-racist. We're working towards that, right? And we need allies because when we do have these votes and they say, oh, 1% of the population are indigenous, that's right. So to say we're gonna have a vote and just us over here, yay, we, do, we want this to change. And everybody else is like, you know, on the opposite end, no, we need the allies, we welcome you. And so um, don't feel embarrassed to say, hey, we would like to, how do we change in our school system, the history books to represent the truth, right? And not to mix, um, you know, like I said, 1492, the first people to uh, experience genocide were the Taino in the Caribbean. Um, and then 200 later, 200 years later, two centuries later, it was the Europeans here in Massachusetts. So we have to unite. Um, we're asking to, for everybody to think about this. You know, how does it affect our youth? You know, and um, now my children, they're learning, they, know how to say um, in their own language, hello, my name is. Um, they love their cacique. Um, culturally, we are re-indigenizing and welcoming other people to re-indigenize. And one other thing that I thought was super important as I became more vocal um, in my own heritage, people popping out of the woodwork. You know, I have my grandmother is this, oh, I do this, oh, I do. And I'm like, exactly, this is what I want. You know, and everyone says, new and there's no indigenous people in new. No, there is. There really is. Um, and so when you have these celebrations, we are having a ceremonial celebration. It's not a powwow. We have other natives that are coming and we're going to share in ceremony and we're going to have non natives there as well. And everyone is welcome. This is a, a community event. And we're hoping that this would spread to the other communities. You know, we are in touch um, with Heather Laval. I absolutely love her. And uh, Claudia, I've seen, you know, walking by her in a powwow and I see some of our petroglyphs and I'm like, oh my goodness, Taino, you know, and it, it really does feel so good. And so what we're trying to do now is the different cities and towns and we're saying, if you need help to change CC to Indigenous Peoples Day, reach out. We've done it. We have people that can support you. Um, it's, it's about just learning the truth. And, uh, you know, when people say how important is IPD to me, it's basically my life and my children's survival. So it's, it's super important. Ha home. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you for sharing. It's yes. beautiful. Thank you for all the work you do. That's hard, right? It's a lot of heavy lifting. Yes. So thank you. <laughs> Larry, I see that you were scribbling. Yeah. You have well, some words. I've been scribbling the whole time. Ah, yeah, good. So, <laughs> I scribble. Um, so yeah, I am. I'm really excited to to have this panel and um, especially to have Darlene here um, speaking about that day. And we'll have a link um, for ways for folks who can support that. And uh, and, I, and also Newton being a, a Nipmuc homeland, um, it, it carries a special place to me. Um, uh, Newton was one of the first uh, praying towns, villages set up where Nipmucs were forced into this place to make room for white expansion. And uh, incidentally, in 1675, during the King Phillips War, those same peaceful Indians, uh, Nipmuc people, were round up and put on Deer Island, uh, hundreds, uh, over a few thousand. And many were stolen off the island, um, starved to death. It was during the winter, they froze, they died. 
And uh, eventually, about eight months later, let the survivors were released from the island and they put them in, uh, they went back to Newton where they lived on a place called Newton Hill. And uh, those survivors lived there for some time, eventually went back to Natick, Hassanamisset, Wabakwasset, and that's how I'm here today from those survivors, uh, the, the Pegan people, the Vickers, uh, many, many other families. Um, and so it's very, uh, when I think about Newton, I think about that, that legacy of, of that land and the, and the people there. So it's important to, to have that Indigenous Peoples Day. And this is what I'm talking about when I say expand that history and that knowledge, because people really need, need to know where they're standing and that benefit that they're having today. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. I think <clears throat> I keep going back to like the land that we're on. And I made a quick note when Claudia was talking is that in Alaska, where I'm from, um, there is a number of schools that are now incorporating uh, with the Pledge of Allegiance, which I think is kind of a nationalistic way to indoctrinate your kids. But um, so in, in, with the Pledge of Allegiance, they're also incorporating a land acknowledgement every day. And I think that that's a beautiful way um, to get people comfortable with hearing our our words, our tribe, our understanding whose land that they're on. Um, very simple, you know? So just throwing that out there, if there's any teachers listening, <laughs> might wanna try that. It's a very great way to do this. Um, uh, Heather, oh my goodness. So you are part of a movement to replace Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day, right? So you're Italian. So what would you say to, Italian people or anybody really who believe that this is sort of erasing your history. Yes, we hear that a lot. <laughs> and, um, you know, first of all, I just want to say that I think there's this perception that all Italian Americans are pro Columbus and it simply is not the case, even though most of the um, Italian American organizations in our country um, claim to speak for all of us. It's just not true. There are so many progressive Italian Americans who feel the same way that I do. And uh, we believe and we tell, we call in our people, you know, we, we talk about how that um, Indigenous Peoples Day is a holiday that celebrates a holiday that celebrates the resilience of indigenous people. It's far more truthful and reflective of our values as Italian Americans than one that honors like one of history's greatest villains. Um, and that any association with Columbus diminishes us, it diminishes our culture and does not honor the experiences and the achievements of our ancestors. All of that, our people's history is obscured. Um, and Indigenous Peoples Day is not about erasing our history. It's about correcting history, telling history more truthfully, more inclusively. And really our goal is to uncenter ourselves from the conversation because too often discussions about renaming the holiday are really centered around the feelings and the concerns of Italian Americans. And um, it's really Indigenous Peoples Day as we're, we know as you know, it's not about Italian Americans at all. It's about it's it's not anti-Italian American. It is anti-Columbus and it is pro-Indigenous people. Um, and often there's this false equivalence that's established, and we see this all the time in, in our in local conversations around renaming the holiday that pits Indigenous people against Italian Americans. That you know, Italian some Italian Americans say that. The holiday commemorates a time when our ancestors overcame terrible ethnic and religious discrimination. And since both groups experienced discrimination, these Italian Americans say, um, why is the pain of indigenous people being prioritized over ours? And what we say is, first of all, genocide and discrimination are not the same. And second of all, many immigrant groups experience discrimination and violence while assimilating in this country and Italian Americans are not unique in that regard. And the issue of how immigrants were and continue to be treated in this country is an entirely separate conversation. And Indigenous Peoples Day is about acknowledging and making amends for one of our country's original sins, the, the way we have treated the first people of this land. Um, and also we remind people that Columbus was purposely introduced and firmly embedded in our country's founding myths 
long before Italians came on the scene. So we talk about how, you know, place names like District of Columbia and Columbia River and Columbia University, those were all named in the 18th century. And so why are we still attaching Italian Americans to this? Um, and Washington Irving wrote that um, biography of Columbus mythologizing him in 1828. So we, you know, we say that it's time for all of us who are part of this country's dominant culture to, and that's Italian Americans included, um, to listen to indigenous people and believe the truths they are telling us. And it's our collective responsibility to acknowledge these truths and repair the harm we've caused by lifting Columbus up as a hero for so long. Um, so, so ultimately, our message is, is that we need to keep the focus on indigenous people, not Italian Americans. And we, um, talk a lot about what we all gain by choosing to celebrate Indigenous people and that this is a gift that is being offered to us and all of us. But really, Italian Americans have a special opportunity here to lead um, and in, in doing the right thing um, and help, um, take us, help us take a step forward towards healing and reconciliation. And that's just an opportunity that we all should take. So. That's kind of how, how we go about making the case to our community. And all of our um, calls to action, like I said, we were um, formed solely to, to support Indigenous people, say, from Massachusetts, and, um, and Indigenous people, say, Massachusetts, and all of our calls to action are based on um, input and um, advice from our Indigenous advisors. Thank you for sharing, Heather. I think that's a very important aspect of this work that's being done. So thank you. Um, Claudia, I know that you, um, you wanna talk about an anti-racism statement. Could you please share? Yes, I wanted to, um, I wanted to say a couple of things from what the, responding to some things that the speakers have said. Um, first of all, I wanna just firmly support doing um, a tribal land acknowledgement before every event. I love the idea of doing it at the same time you do the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, we spent the last year as one of our initiatives, I've been working with seventh graders in my own building, helping them understand genocide, the history of indigenous people, so that when they became eighth graders, we were a K-8 system, um, they would be ready to lead every single event with a tribal land acknowledgement, not a pat statement. That might be what we write on the wall, but something that would live and change as current events change, as current research and knowledge changes. So this is, um, you know, just think about when do you say your pronouns? That's when you should be doing a tribal land acknowledgement. And there's two pieces to that. One is the formal statement before the event starts. And the second is your own personal acknowledgement um, as you travel, as you introduce yourself. So that's one thing I wanted to say. The other thing I want to say is that there is, um, there's a lot of conversation about race, racism, and anti-racism, especially in this country in the past year. And I am all for it, and I've spent 30 years working for an organization that, it, they, that calls itself an anti-racist organization. It is an anti-racist organization. There's nothing wrong with anti-racism. It's just not enough when you are including indigenous people. And I wanna specify that because indigenous people have the experiences of people from multiple racial groups. Our tribal identities, our tribal sovereignty, our citizenship as tribal people is one thing. And the racial group that we look like or are defined by others by and how we were treated is a, another thing. So if we are really going to include indigenous voices in this conversation, it cannot be just labeled as anti-racism. I don't have the right other word. I tend to use decolonization or anti-colonialism, but there has to be some other piece to really include the voices. And one of the um, most apparent places where you can, under, you can understand this is um, your boarding schools continued in the United States officially since till, until 1978 when the um, Indian Child Welfare Act was passed. It was until 1996 in Canada. So there are much, it's much more recent and it is being challenged in the United States 
as an unfair racial policy. You cannot tell us which racial group is allowed to adopt indigenous children. And while race is involved, this is really a sovereignty issue. This is indigenous people saying, no, actually you cannot tell a nation who they can let their children be adopted by. So this is why it needs to be really clear when you're having a race conversation and when you're having a conversation about indigenous sovereignty. Um, you know, we're not gonna go into Germany and say, uh, we think other nations should be able to adopt your children um, or foster care or whatever the current way to steal children from families is. So I just wanted to be clear about that language and about how we also need to get out of the colonized structure of that it is a black white race dialogue because it is way bigger than that or more inclusive than that. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you very much for sharing. Um, did you have any more comments? Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, I wanted to swing back to CK George briefly. Um, yeah. Since uh, as we said in the beginning, it's that that premise, that uh, that, that beginning, that nascent stage of, of meeting. So, and, uh, and by the way, I've known Jorge for um, many, many years and we were both a lot younger and had less gray hair uh, going way, way back. And so I, I was curious to wonder what, what would you envision for, for the Taino people and two, how could folks find out more information? As you know, time's limited and there's so much story to share about any of our, our, our people. So um, what do you envision and how could folks find out more information? Well, <clears throat> the, the definitive book on Taino or I haven't written it yet, so that's coming. <laughs> um, but uh, my, my vision is, is to get people back home um, to acknowledge that this is, uh, this is a reality because when you speak about colonization, I mean, we were the first colony, you know? And so the process is a lot longer for us. I mean, Puerto Rico is still a colony. So that colonial mindset is, is very well hammered in, in, into us. So the first thing for me is starting is by teaching our own people what is indigeneity, what is not, what is present, what is not. And uh, a lot of people from the Caribbean are surprised to find out that, you know, that like, like Darlene was saying that this is indigenous, this is, you know, and, and, and that's amazing. Um, a lot of our people like to, uh, to tread along those trails of uh, recognition. Um, and, and, and I think that's important, but for me, uh, recognition from other native people is more important to me than recognition by any government. You know, so I, um, my vision for the Taino people is just to be part of the discussion and, 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 and be, uh, you know, part of everything that goes on and, 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 and be acknowledged and uh, move forward into the future. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. And he's grayer than I am. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why I wear a hat. <laughs> <laughs> I think I need a hat too. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> I wanted to move forward now um, to talk about our list of resources. But before I do that, I just want to swing back around to any of our panelists that want to have any last thoughts or comments um, about celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day. Make sure we're good. Go ahead, Melissa. I just want to say, I just want, you know, people to take a minute and look for those indigenous, those brilliant indigenous authors and read the books like Claudia had spoke of. Um, you know, I have all these, this, my pile is growing really, really vastly here. And, you know, Robin, Robin Wall Kimmerer, Braiding Sweetgrass, Professor Denowden has some really awesome books. Lisa Brooks, Our Beloved Kin. Take the time to, to read some of these, these authors and, and just learn um, and reach out, as Brittany had so brilliantly said, to your, your local tribe and get to know them. You know, it, the only way to learn is, to, is to, to meet people. So thanks so much. That's it. Okay, thank you. Um, so I wanted to like reiterate, like we do, we did work on this list as a panel. Um, we had a, a document up and running and um, this resource document will kind of help towns, cities, businesses, schools, 
uh, kind of navigate on how to properly celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, one of the first things, if you haven't figured it out by now, <laughs> is identify whose land you live on, right? And um, Claudia Fox Tree added um, to read what is a tribal land acknowledgement and why do we need them? Claudia, do you want to do you want to add a comment about that? Um, I get that I get a, the question a lot, and um, I get invited to do tribal land acknowledgements, and. I have even been invited for national organizations to write their tribal land acknowledgement. And I don't do that. I don't write it for other people. I really feel like you need to do your own work. You need to acknowledge, you need to um, think about what you would say. I'm happy to do it if it makes sense for me to do it. And certainly if you have an indigenous person who wants to do it in your organization, open the floor. Um, you know, don't be like some other places that are like, no, we have two white people ready to do it. You know, be ready to yield the floor. Um, and don't expect indigenous people to do it. When, you know, they might say where they're from, but if they're on their own land, it's unlikely that they're gonna say, and by the way, this is my land, although they might, um, but don't expect that. So just like be aware. And since I got the question a lot, I, and I'm speaking at a um, conference, that hosted this particular blog, I wrote about what you need to do, where you can find information, what you should think about. And I feel like plenty of people have talked about this and brought in their expertise. So I cite those people and I make links to who you can read more about it. And it's not done. It is evolving and you're not done. We're still fighting about land boundaries, frankly, here in Massachusetts, you know, it's wishy-washy. So you need to keep doing research and updating that way anyway. And, you know, what year are you looking at the map? You know, what was the name? Are you going to go with the traditional name or the ancestral name, which wasn't written? And so what lettering are you going to use? I mean, there's a lot of things to think about. And acknowledging that this is a process and you're on that step is an important part of a tribal land acknowledgement. And the final step is reaching out to your local community and getting accurate information um, about indigenous people and life ways from this area, past, present, and future. Exactly, thank you. Um, and that ties in with items number two and three on our list are what happened to that community or tribal nation? And where are they today? Uh, three is lift and amplify current indigenous voices. Um, four, support indigenous artists and cultural centers through donations, through sharing their work. Um, five, remunerate indigenous speakers generously for their time and sharing with your community. It's a very important piece because as indigenous people we're always asked to educate, um, always asked to undo colonialism, racism for free. I don't know how many times I've gone into my daughter's school every year because I was expected to. I'll do it, you know, because I, I, I want to be there for my daughter's class. Um, yeah, I just, I just wanted to jump in and uh, what Claudia was saying as well as um, a couple of things about land acknowledgements. So first of all, I want everybody who's listening, wherever you are, that uh, when you think about a land acknowledgement, I think it's important for people to realize this is something that we've always done as indigenous people. Since I was a kid, wherever we would travel to another tribe's land, we would acknowledge that. This is an ancient practice of acknowledging that land. It's nothing new. I think that needs to be very underscored. And so when you are doing that, you are taking part in an ancient practice of how to respect and, and, and share in that land. Uh, secondly, Okitail is an organization uh, and myself personally get tons of emails from people uh, uh, towns and, and organizations and schools saying uh, a quick email, can you please give me an land acknowledgement? And so that's not, um, that's what we call transactional. Uh, you, you, it's really important to make it an intentional relationship because that's how we got into this problem in the first place. We can't just pop out a, a, a land acknowledgement for you, you know, um, and so that really work and get to know the people you are on. And, uh, and I understand you're going to need help. Uh, you're going to need help. But this allies work, it's, it uncovers a lot and it's, it's always a learning curve. Uh, allies make mistakes. They say things they shouldn't. Uh, people get uncomfortable and we've, we've all, I've certainly have. 
and uh, um, there's, there's space for forgiveness, but there's space that needs to be for learning. So you're going to essentially need help on that because you just don't know. And it was on purpose that you don't know. So it's important to, to make those intentional relationships with the land acknowledgement. Yeah, by all means. Yeah. Um, I, I just returned from a, a trip to the Dominican Republic. Um, and I was up in this area that's called Samana. And uh, it's, a, it's a very pristine area. And the whole time that I was there, I was, uh, I was upset because the people that lived there were not Taino. And these are uh, people that were called the Ciguayo people. Um, and I was just amazed that like even the Dominican Republic that you have a lot of this iconography all over the place dealing with Taino, they Taino fight that whole peninsula when in fact it's not a Taino place. It was, and uh, before I left, I had to say a prayer. I had to say something because, you know, like, like Larry said, it's, it's what we do, you know, like at, at our house, whenever we have ceremony, we, we start by always acknowledging the people that live in the land. It's just the right thing to do, you know. Um, it's really not a stretch of the imagination. It, it is you know, the way it's supposed to be, you know. So I just wanted to add that because I, I was really upset being there and, and not seeing anything that dealt, not even their name was anywhere, you know. And um, that was pretty sad. That is pretty sad. And that's also, you know, gentrification and mm -hmm. colonization, usurping the lands and moving indigenous people out of the way. Right. Um, so I'm sorry you had to go through that. But thank you for your prayers. Thank you. Yeah. Um, where was I? Oh, support legislation to change to Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, you know, also, you know, like our, our five bills, they kind of work hand in hand. You know, I went over them in the land acknowledgement in the beginning, um, but we kind of have to have, we have one, you can't count, we can't change mascots without having education, right? So they all kind of work together. So supporting legislation for Indigenous Peoples Day, supporting legislation uh, to remove Native American mascots from public schools, so support the legislation to ensure accurate Indigenous curricula in Massachusetts, um, taught to all the school children in the state, that needs to happen. Um, and of course, as I said before, recognizing that dominant, dominant narrative um, that glorifies colonization and make those changes. It's not, not so hard. You know, a lot of um, different organizations change from Pioneer Valley something something to the Valley something or Connecticut River Valley. I mean, there's lots of options. We don't have to rely on, on glorification like that. Um, it's, it's a microaggression that we deal with every day. Um, 10, I love this one. I'm super excited about this one. Watch or have a showing of indigenous documentaries and films. Um, Vision Maker has several films to watch, but there's also on Hulu coming up next week, there's Reservation Dogs, which is to my knowledge, one of the first indigenous written, indigenous acted and mainstreamed um, uh, show that's gonna be uh, premiered on Hulu. Um, August 6th. That is for me like, yeah, right? Like amazing. Um, because as indigenous people, we are less than 2% in our own country. We are less than 0.4% uh, in Massachusetts. We don't have representation in mainstream society. I mean, most of the audience, um, you might struggle to remember the last TV show you saw with a primary character that was indigenous that wasn't relegated to the past or wasn't stereotypified. Um, so this for us is like really amazing to see. Um, oh, okay, let's see, 11. Oh, now this one I really like. Uh, create, create meals that reflect traditional cultural foods of tribal nations here on Turtle Island. Oh yeah, I could get down with that one. <laughs> but also discussing um, which foods are indigenous and how they contribute to the cuisines around the world, um, as well as industrial revolutions, right? Because we fed industrial revolutions in Europe. Um, connect beyond food to um, historical and contemporary agricultural systems. The agricultural systems uh, and land management systems that were here were very complex. And um, we need to understand traditional environmental knowledge to move forward in today's world of climate change. Um, we also need to recognize indigenous versus invasive species. 
um, read books. Uh, as Melissa was saying, one of the best things you can do is just read. And we have incredible, um, amazing indigenous authors out here. Um, and so American Indians in Children's Literature by Deborah Reese is an amazing top-notch uh, blog. That's, that's my go-to resource um, when people ask for appropriate books. Um, support land back initiatives in your area. Um, you know, and that would include tribal nations that are also, you know, getting their own corporations together to, to take land holdings back again um, to support their, their own burial grounds, which are, you know, they need to be in their own holdings. Um, there's a couple of different, you know, Massachusetts or local uh, land back initiatives, a Native Land Conservancy, NIPMA Cultural Preservation, and Eastern Woodlands Rematriation Collective. Um, engage in active learning uh, with other groups using a tool uh, like the 21 Day Indigenous Challenge. That sounds like fun. I'm up for the challenge. Um, and fighting racism since 1492. Um, Illuminative is a great website. I love Illuminative. Um, they have an incredible resource page um, for Indigenous People's Day toolkits, lessons, plans, ally resources. Um, I, I, I adore their website. They have a toolkit for everything. Um, if your in community is considering a campaign to rename a holiday, um, seek guidance from Indigenous People's Day MA, Indigenous People's Day Massachusetts. They've been working on this legislature for years. Um, and of course, if you are of Italian American descent, become a, a member of the Italian Americans for Indigenous People's Day and, you know, sign their statement, become a good ally in that way and, you know, become more than an ally, I guess, start looking towards becoming an accomplice, like make that an actionable thing. Um, there's also a number of other reading resources um, on Taino people, which um, Darlene has put into our toolkit. Um, that will be part of the post show kind of email and it will be also on the Okotail website um, soon, soon after we do this. We'll probably add a few more things. We always do, right? <laughs> Um, so I want to go back through. I want to circle back. Does any uh, panelists have anything they want to say? Brittany. About me. Thank you. Um, I popped my hand up. I think you were on number nine uh, speaking about the legislation and that brought a few thoughts together for me. Uh, one of them is, of course, to support it, of course, um, and mention that apart these pieces of legislation, they are valuable and they are important and I wouldn't put my energy behind um, any one piece if I didn't think so, but also to kind of step back and really look at the impact that these pieces of legislation can have when they're comprehensive, because that's when you're really gonna see a lot of positive change. And that kind of brings together this, um, maybe a little cheesy, but interwoven, an interwoven kind of thought, right? These things really can come together and hold a lot of this when they're woven together. And that, was um, a little bit of where I wanted to jump from, you know, look at what's going on locally, support this legislation. But I think it would be a miss not to mention too um, things that are going on nationally, just to keep an eye even get involved, but even just keep an eye on things like line three, a pipeline that goes through over 20 waterways, water pieces, bodies of water. Um, and also to pay attention to uh, what, um, Auntie Deb, what Deb Holland is doing um, with, with the legislation on um, all of the, whether you want to say boarding school um, or a residential school or industrial school, uh, depending on where you're looking on, um, you know, North America, you might use a different term, but to pay attention to these things. And lastly, to remind folks that yes, they are involved with native culture, of course they are, but something like our water, water is not innately an indigenous thing. I think we all need it. We're all made up of it. So really the push to not just be allies, but yes, to be accomplices, to put action behind your thoughts, it does affect all of us in the same way that native mascots, they, they hurt native people, but they hurt non-native people too. You know, our water is something that I think we all need. So to remember that, yes, it is involved with native people and to not take that away from us. But in a sense, if you join in, the future is going to 
be with all of us, right? And so we want to work towards a better future together, whether it is our local legislation or whether it is paying attention to line three right now, if we really want to get somewhere together, pay attention now and become an accomplice now. That's, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you so much for saying that, Brittany. I just um, wanted to piggyback on that by saying we all need to support each other as Indigenous people because our sovereignties are under attack and all of these extractive industries are you know, attacking our land, our resources, our water, our food. Um, and we are all stronger when we stand together in that way. Like, so my, my village is Koktovik in Area 1002 of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, and we are fighting um, extractive industry that's happening there now. Um, I know I see Anthony here, and his own tribal nation has not had clean drinking water in decades. Um, these, are, these are issues that affect all of us. I mean, the Navajo Nation hasn't had potable water since the 40s. Um, so we talk about Flint, right? Well, what about indigenous people? Um, so I think that supporting each other is super important. We need to show up for each other. And um, yes, we have issues here in our own homelands, wherever we may be as indigenous people, but we also need to have the backs of each other. So thank you so much for bringing that up, Brittany. And I know, Melissa, you had your hand raised too. Hello. So I have three quick things. First, I wanted to trickle back to Heather and, you know, indigenous people, we always say that, you know, we, we always look at people as people, right? It's the character and the person that you, you admire, regardless of their race or identity. And I love an Italian American. My husband comes from a long family of Italian Americans. He is his given tribal name, um, an honorary name he was given is Silent Bear. He's a US veteran. And I just wanted to thank you for, you know, understanding that and he's one of my biggest supporters. So I did want to add that. And then I was just going to go back real quick to what Brittany was saying about the water and the land. And it brought me to a, just a real quick quote that I shared from, um, our Jennifer Harding. She's one of our tribal counselors, but one of the best gifts and the greatest gift she gives our community is she's one of the very few fluent Wampanoag speakers. And she said uh, to us uh, one day, she just said, in the Wampanoag language, there is a final marker that is called an inalienable M. You can add this onto a certain word or in the, in the language, and that word will take on an entirely different meaning. Take the word aki, land, for example, when Wampanoag people say Natakim, it does not just mean my land, as we would say in the English language. When Wampanoag people say Natakim or Natnapim, my water, we mean that this land or this water is literally a part of our bodies, our DNA, our soul, our energy. We are made of the same stuff we are one with the land and the water. And that was Healing Waters, Jennifer Harding. And then I just have real quickly, as I was doing some research, uh, Paul Chart Smith, he's a Comanche. He said, the most American thing about America is American Indians. Thank you, that was it. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you for sharing. Um, does anybody else have any last comments here? Because then we can move to some Q and A. Larry, did you have something? I say no. Okay. Um, I always do, but I'll, I'll hold off for now. <laughs> <laughs> well, now's the time, right? <laughs> no, I was I was just reflecting on. Um, so yeah, and actually, this is a good point because for those who are watching and um, thinking about getting involved, and um, just kind of if you kind of zoom out and see what's happening here, um, like my younger cousin Brittany and, and Darlene and many other folks who are working on whether it's anti mascot or. Indigenous Peoples Day, it's kind of a town by town thing. Um, and so we're encouraging folks on the federal and state level to see the wisdom in having that. So uh, my point is you see these very talented, creative, artistic people taking their energy fighting just to say that they exist, not pursuing their intellectual curiosities, not pursuing the things that they love to do, like my love of surfing. So I can't surf because I gotta tell people I'm, I'm here. So that's taking time away from my enjoyment. So we have to 
we're spending energies and time and resources just telling people we're here. And so and it's, um, I remember one ally told me before, he said, it's, it's an embarrassment that you guys have to do that. It's, it's shameful on my part as, as, a, as a white person. And I, and I humbly listened to him and I, and I thought about that in, in so many various ways and, and just let him, let him share it. But that was his, his take on it. And he was like, you, you folks here, you shouldn't have to, you know, plead for your existence, you know, but yet we are. And if we don't, we will, we will die. And so this is where allyship and accomplishments come in. So I just wanted to kind of reflect on that, how this work is very important on the national level, that it's important. And, um, and quickly about Mr. CC, you know, the implicit bias, right? That he discovered anything. It's just saying it's, it's implicit racism that there was nobody else here until white people showed up. So it, it's just really, uh, you know, beyond the, the, the stand of reason to just kind of accept these things as, as okay. So yeah, I was gonna say that. <laughs> I'm glad you did. Thank you. <laughs> I think we have a question from our audience online. Yeah, Claudia answered this, but uh, okay. maybe she could tell everyone what was the name of the act that was passed in the U.S. in 1978. Oh, that, that well, yeah, that was uh, the Native American uh, Freedom of Religion Act. Is that is that what we were talking about, Claudia? Indian Child Welfare Act. They were oh, both that year. Well. There was a lot that happened in 1978. Both of those, yes. for example. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there was two things. So our 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 religion was outlawed until 1978. Fun fact. Um, and our children could be taken away from us until 1978. Fun fact. And that wasn't strengthened until the 80s. Fun fact. Um, any other questions from the audience here? No. <laughs> Oh my goodness, are we actually gonna be like kind of on time today? <laughs> I'll just, I mean, have our folks from Wellesley here show up. Okay, thank you. So we have other towns who are coming and really, really interested. So this is um, this is an important issue for a lot of towns and folks and, you know, who are working on this. So we're really glad you're here to, you know, and um, I hope it was very informative for you and I appreciate you coming physically. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, I want to like, let's give a round of applause for all of our panelists today. I, I, I think it's amazing that they're able to, to be on more Zoom calls and more panels on such a gorgeous day. We've been having a lot of rain, so thank you so much. Um, Larry, do you want to give some final? Um, just real quick, I, I really want to thank the panel for, for sharing their time with us. This is so, such an important issue um, that we had this opportunity. And I want to thank all of you for, for sharing uh, this time. And um, all those who are out there listening, Kutavadamish, uh, thank you very much. And uh, it's, you know, the story continues. And uh, find out how you can get engaged. Uh, that's the most important thing, get engaged. Uh, this is not, you know, a spectator. Uh, activity. There's, there's, a, there's a place for everybody to get involved in one way or the other. And we're seeing that. That's why Okite was here today. So uh, again, Kutabadamish. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I also I want to say thank you to everyone that's here and, and for, for having invited me. And I think you're amazing, Rhonda, because when we spoke yesterday, um, uh, you were still trying to put this together and to do it like this and for it to end exactly when it's supposed to like, <laughs> that is art. <laughs> No, no, no. All the kudos goes to the panelists because they're amazing. And I knew that they were going to do exactly what needed to get done. So thank you. <laughs> Where can people go to find out more information? Ocateo.org. Yes, thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I think we're done. Thank you. <laughs> it's a wrap. <laughs> Peace, Ganache. Aquani.